All right, it's preparing the stream. And we should be live on YouTube here. And uh, there might be some some folks as we're doing this that that might ask um, some questions throughout this. And so, you know, maybe sure. if, if we can reserve a little time at the end, I'll, I'll kind of uh, curtail the <laughs> our conversation and, and oh, dude. yeah you're good i got i got a couple beers here do your thing i got all right I'm gonna be now man cool all right well i got i got my uh, iced coffee and if i look a little glossy it's super hot here and none of the houses in in oakland california have air conditioning because the store uh, it never gets above 80 degrees but it's like 95 right now <laughs> dang, yeah yeah, yeah that's how my wife's uh, family up in michigan they don't have ac either it just never gets that hot yeah the dead of summer so. yeah every once in a while we get a we get a hot one well eric thank you so much for for agreeing to to do this this is this is a lot of fun for me and i've been sort of really lucky in the last couple of weeks i've been trying to do this with all of the the session musicians from la to nashville yeah. and really trying to get as many people involved to kind of hear their perspective their their uh, approach uh, to gear and to to creating hits and for people that are not familiar with you i mean you you've you're you're in 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 my view the 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 first call guy that everybody seems to be uh using and you've played on so many hit records it's almost impossible to count i think that at this point what's the what's the running total do you know how many how many number ones you've been on at this point it's somewhere in the 50s right or more um yeah i think i actually i think i'm like in the 70s right now Seventies, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 a uh, you know it's uh, that's that's a pretty uh, it's a pretty great honor to to have you on here and. Uh, oh, thanks, man. But the the thing that uh, I really want to kind of know about, sort of starting back with when you kind of got started in doing sessions, did you feel like there was a, a particular session or a particular moment that you feel like was sort of the pivot that sort of made you? move to the top of people's list when they're considering people to hire for a, a you know guitarist for a session or do you feel like it was like a culmination of like multiple things that kind of continued to happen over time uh man for me my experience definitely the latter because you know i think i think one people one thing that a lot of people don't probably um understand um, in terms of music and the way it's released is it's really common that, you know, whatever record I was, I'm working on this week, it might be 18 months, two years before some of that music is, is out depending on release schedules or they may, you know, they may throw out one single from the, you know, the entire entirety of the album, but they wait for that single to peak and that can take, you know, eight months, nine months, you know, sometimes 50 weeks for that single to peak and then the rest of the work to come out. So I definitely remember, you know, a period of time where I was starting to play on a, a lot of records um, for major labels, but none of that music was out yet. Right. So it was a very intangible sort of success for anybody that wasn't me because you know, I, I knew, you know, the stuff I'm working on and the producers I'm working for, but none of it had been released yet. So there, there was definitely a, a, a big period there where I kind of was was doing it, but still, you know, hadn't had a song chart, number one, hadn't had a an album, you know, released. It was just kind of like, well, you can listen to this one single on Spotify or on the radio or, or, or whatever. Um so yeah, and, and I also have used this analogy before. It's kind of like it's kind of like someone that loses a bunch of weight, right? Like if, <laughs> if 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 you don't see somebody for two years and all of a sudden they've lost a hundred pounds, you're like, oh my god, wow, dude, you look incredible. Like, how did you? Wow, you lost all this weight. But to that person, you know, they've just been watching it every day come off two pounds at a time, three pounds at a time, five pounds at a time. So even though, you know, yes, undeniably, they've now lost 100 pounds. 
it happened so gradually for them that they don't feel any different. It's not the same feeling. You know, I didn't just wake up one morning and, and was on, you know, 10 songs on the radio. It kind of slowly but surely happened gradually over time. And so, yeah, you don't, you don't really feel that different, you know, later on down the road. There, there wasn't some moment where, you know, a song came out and then all of a sudden everyone was calling me for their records, you know. Yeah, that's a, a, actually a really good sort of uh, way to, to explain that that culmination, you know, uh, because uh, yeah. <laughs> there really is a huge latency in the record release process when you're playing on something. It, it, when you're do, when you were doing some of those early ones, like which was the first one that you feel like was was a was a really big hit that you played on? Well, um, the first number one that I played on uh, was a song. Um, there's a band called Little Big Town, and they had a song. They had a song called Day Drinking. It's just like a summer single. But what's funny enough about that is. I didn't even play on that tracking session. They had taken some of my parts from the demo uh. that they, you know, when they, you know, they had kind of fallen in love with some stuff from the demo. And then, um, and then that, you know, I got a call from the writer. I remember Barry Dean calling me going, Jay Joyce just played me the single mix and they ended up using a bunch of your stuff from the demo. And I was, Oh, cool. And then, you know, again, nine months later, that became a number one song. And, uh, and then it was a, um, very similar situation with a Maddie and Tay song called girl in a country song. It was a big hit for them. Same thing. I had played on a version of that song that they ended up re-recording and they went to go work with Dan Huff and Dan Huff ended up liking some of my parts from this other version of a recording. He kept them. And then that kind of led to me ultimately you know, I kind of heard through the grapevine. Yeah, Dan kept some of your parts on the, this Maddie and Tay project. And then it was like a week, two weeks after that, I get this call from his production assistant says, hey, Dan would like you to come play on this Billy Currington record. Um, so again, even in those things, even my first, you know, kind of two number ones, again, talk about a, a kind of latency situation. I wasn't even really involved in the tracking. It was kind of like I got lumped in because some parts you know, they had gotten married to some things that I played on earlier versions and just couldn't let go of them. So they ended up using those. And then that, you know, then just staggered into then working with those people in a direct way. And then, you know, stuff going off from there. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I had this conversation. Uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, Alanis Morissette uh, record that kind of the first one that really put yeah, her Jack on. Little Pill, of course. Yeah. yeah. Huge record. Right. So I was talking to, you know, obviously like Dave Navarro played on some of those songs, yep. but a lot of the behind the scenes guys, obviously Michael Landa, I think was on a few. And then this other guy who a lot of people don't know about is named Basil Fung. And he was the guy that did those really cool, like jangly chorus, uh, tristeria chorus parts, like on uh, ironic, you know, yeah. like where it kind of transitions from like the heavy. Yeah. Uh, you know rhythm distortion and then it goes to that really clean um and so i was talking to him about that and you know and, and he said the same thing like it was recorded as a demo yeah he didn't know that it, you know they they didn't tell him until you know close to when the record was being released only because he was friends with the producer said oh we ended up keeping your <laughs> the parts you recorded oh, exactly. uh, for the demo yeah. you know and then uh, of course they, they brought in other guys for for different things but uh Man, and was that a lot of what you were doing sort of in the early days when you were kind of cutting your teeth? You, you were you were doing a lot of demos or what did that kind of look like in the early days? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's and, you know, and the demo scene is, you know, I won't say that it's unique to like obviously demos happen outside of Nashville, but we definitely have an entire kind of cottage industry for, you know, demos. I mean, there are, you know you can make a living as a session musician in Nashville and only be playing on demos. You can keep your calendar full, you know, um, uh, working on that kind of stuff, you know, three sessions a day, six days a week. If you, you know, if, if you want, and if you're in demand, you know, and um, that was definitely, you know, in, when I was, you know, younger and, 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 and into it, 
you know, I would just work like a savage. Like I, you know, I was young and single and didn't have any, you know, nothing else to, you know, nothing to tie me down, you know, nothing, nothing urgent to get home to, you know, eventually I got a dog, you know, but it was like, <laughs> I would, um, yeah, just, just an animal. Like I would just say yes to everything. Yes, 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 yes. You know, 10, two, six, six days a week, seven days a week, like whatever I could. And, um, you know, that I just kind of felt like at the time, you know, it's just like, just honing my craft. Like, I just felt like, well, I'm, this stuff is all going to make me better for when I start, you know, hopefully getting called to go play on big records. And yeah, it was it definitely started in the demo thing for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so in those early days, what did, uh, when you're doing all these demos, what did your rig look like at that time? Oh, um, well, I, you know, I mean, I, so in Nashville, I mean, one thing that, you know, a just the concept of cartage is is a thing in Nashville that we have that maybe some folks don't um, kind of grasp. And and you know, if you if you're lucky, you get to a point where you have enough stuff piled up somewhere, and uh, you can get. Um, there's companies that will store it and haul it and set you up on your sessions, right? And for the most part, at, at once you're working at a certain kind of level that cost is incurred by whoever you're working for. Right. So like that expense is, is, is there and um, you know, your gears there, but then we also have what we call carry in sessions, which is when they say, Hey, we're trying to keep costs down. Would you mind just carrying in? And that happened a lot, you know, in the early days for me and man, it was like a Princeton reverb, small pedal board. And I'd bring like two double gig bags with, you know, like a Les Paul, a Strat, a Tele and maybe a baritone. Right. You know, that was the that was the rig you know that for for 80 percent of it and then if you were on a really high high you know high class demo if you will and you had cartage you know they'd bring in the amp you know the amp wall and bigger pedal board and some more guitars and stuff but um i had already been amassing quite a bunch of gear from when i was touring you know i was already kind of stockpiling amps and guitars and stuff in my early 20s while I was you know doing the road thing was there sort of a go-to uh sort of tone that you think was sort of like that you used a lot on a lot of those early recordings or like uh, you know on that first hit it was there something in particular or was it just a bunch of different stuff depending on just how the track was layered man yeah I can't say go-to sound um it's it's like anything though I mean you you know, you learn a new trick or you get a new pedal or you get a new guitar. And if you're like me, you know, you tend to kind of run it into the ground. And so I can definitely in hindsight, go back and listen and go, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember when I got a goat keeper, you know, and uh, you know, you hear a bunch of tracks with the, that, 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 the stutter yeah. stuff or, oh yeah. I remember when I got a, you know, I was on that John Mayer trip and got a Qtron pedal or whatever it was, you know, so you can, you can definitely kind of go back and go, oh yeah. I remember when I was in that that phase um but at the same time you know nothing that consistently that i was just kind of like oh yeah all the the big records i played on i was using this you know that that not in that way right was there a point when you felt like there was sort of like a like a like a signature thing that you started doing that like all the producers were asking you to do man that's a good question um I think what I can say is um, when I started working heavily in sessions, um, the, a lot of the keys players were, were a lot older than, than me, the guys that were kind of doing the records. And um, the, the soundscape thing, the, the, the pads and the arpeggiators and the pulsing rhythms and stuff um, was kind of viewed as a thing that, that happened in pre-production or in post-production or we'll let a programmer handle that. Mm -hmm. And just because of the records that I was listening to, um, I wanted to incorporate some of that stuff um, on sessions. And so I would say if there was a thing that maybe separated me early on, it was some of the soundscape stuff. It was the stuff that didn't sound like guitar. It was 
you know, being able to play a pad, uh, you know, uh, that sounded like an analog synth on guitar or being able to simulate, you know, a synth bass, an 808 sound with a with an octave fuzz and just kind of some of those, um, you know, textural things that, you know, not only were kind of maybe fresh, but they certainly weren't used to hear and come from the guitar chair, right? Yeah. So I think it was, you know, I mean, you know, you'd love to say it was like, oh, the blazing solos. But I really I really think it was just kind of some of the some of the more textural and and ambient things that, you know, people identified from some of the pop records um, that I was able to kind of mimic as a guitar player. Were, were producers specifically mentioning like, hey, I want you to use, you know, that th that thing you used on the Kenny Chesney record or, or like were they specifically referencing specific things like that? Or was it was it more uh, ethereal uh, or abstract in their requests? You know, that happens more on the demo world. I think on the records, producers and artists, they'd be a little cautious to just reference, you know, their peers records. Right. You know, if you're if you're Blake Shelton, you're not going to go, hey, do that thing you did on Kenny Chesney's record. Right. Um, right. But certainly, <laughs> but certainly for songwriters that, you know, have a song and they want, you know, they want it potentially to be heard by Miran Morris and Miran Morris to love it. If you do a thing, a thing that's similar to something you've done on a Marin record, yeah. then that correlates to them. And they're like, oh yeah, that thing. Or, you know, I love what you did on this song. And, you know, this is for that same artist. So could we do something similar to that? So in that way, yes. Producer to producer, referencing record to record, not so much. I think it, at the very least, pride would probably stop them from doing that. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to sound like you're thirsty, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah hey, I, can you do that thing for that other producer on that other <laughs> artist record for us? You know, I think that gets a little, <laughs> little touch and go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure that part of the art of being a, a, a great uh, session musician as you as you are is is sort of being able to read between the lines. I mean, yeah, I think that's always part of the, um, you know, you're, you're, there's always a, a, a large amount of interpretation that, that you're doing. You know, you're, you're taking someone's words and you're trying to kind of take what's important. And, and you know, look, some people are really exceptional communicators. You know, when you work for a guy like Dan Huff or who's an amazing guitar player in his own right, or, 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 or even a, even a Frank Rogers, it's like, those guys are pretty good at articulating um, in in guitar terms. You know, they they can say, "Hey, you know, maybe it's a different amp," or "Hey, can you can you brighten the tone on just the reverb a little bit, or this or that? Can you back down the delays and that kind of stuff?" And and then yeah, for some of the less technical people or people that just aren't guitar players, it becomes a lot more esoteric. It becomes you know it needs to be softer or I want it to hit harder or, you know, those kinds of things. And that's where the interpretation comes in a little bit, or, you know, even if they reference another artist, if they say, man, it just needs to be more Tom Petty. And you go, okay, well, which of the 500 songs in the Tom Petty catalog, do we want it to be more like, because, you know, that can be a, there can be a wide berth just in that one reference. Right. Are you, are you grabbing your Rickenbacker? Or are you getting your Tweed Deluxe out in a telly? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is it, is it, you know, into the great wide open or is it last dance with Mary Jane? Cause those are two yeah, yeah. different, you know, vibes. And, and so. Yeah. No, I, I hear that for sure. Yeah. It's certainly, uh, you know, some of the, the, the commonalities of a lot of the session guys, they sort of have their own lookup table when people say X, then, you know, yeah. they, they follow the chart over, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's all part of the, you know, I won't say the game, but that's all part of the, the skill set. you know, when you're there, it's, it's just really like interpreting a reference. That's yeah. the, that's such a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the, um, so you, uh, to kind of go back to the, the trajectory here, you were doing a lot of demos. You had some number one hits, you became more established. When do you feel like was the point with which like your phone was ringing off the hook 
and you were you were literally booking you know like back to back sessions with you know the 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 big guns like how many years do you think you had in at that point before that really started to to uh, cement yeah okay yeah well if we look at it like that in terms of years um i mean i can say this i can say that i quit touring at the end of 2011 to focus solely on playing sessions yeah. and i can say that um, I think the first single I had on the radio was 2015, either late 2014 or early 2015. So, you know, yeah, you're looking at three and a half or four years um, before, you know, any of that was, you know, reaping dividends in terms of, you know, music in the masses. Right. And then, you know, tack another year or two onto that before any of that music got to number one, you know, before I was, you know, able to say, oh, I've now played on a number one song or, or been on a number one album. Um, so, you know, definitely, definitely that. And then even then, you know, it's still, it was, it was, you know, relatively limited to, you know, there was a, a, a couple producers that had started using me were using me on some records, but um, by no stretch of the imagination was I on every album in town, you know, and um, I, you know, and then, and then, um, and then, yeah, I mean, maybe by, you know, maybe 2016, 2017, I think that's when I won like the guitar player of the year for the first time from, from the ACMs or something like that. And then about then, but again, I mean, it, you, it's that, it's the thing. It's like, it, it certainly didn't happen overnight and there wasn't one record that came out that caused everybody to start calling me. It yeah. definitely just kind of, you know, like I said, you get a call from Frank Rogers to come play on a Scotty McCreary record. And then, one, then Dan Huff calls you to come play on something. You're working for Dan. And then six months go by and Scott Hendricks calls you to come play on Blake Shelton. And then another few months go by. And so it, it does just kind of pile up in this, you know, staggered way that it, it, it feels like walking up a hill and not climbing straight up a mountain. Sure, you know? sure, sure. And and as you became more in demand, did the did the type of equipment that you used? Did you just add to the arsenal, or did you find that there was only a, a stable of of items that were typical that you would use on on most every session, and and not so much having this huge uh, backline or this huge uh, cartridge yeah. rig that you'd bring in? Yeah, well. You know, I'll tell you, there, there, there's two answers there. I mean, um, one, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of guitar players would agree that there's certain, you know, quote unquote, blue chip pieces, you know, amps, guitars that you, you know, you're going to you're going to have a need and want a great Telecaster. You know, you're going to have a need and want a, a great Les Paul, things like the, of that, you know. Um, and uh, again, I've been lucky to acquire some good instruments even when I was touring. So when I came off the road to start sessions, you know, I, I already had, you know, more than a handful of guitars and a few different amps. I kind of had, you know, some of the basic, you know, I had a, a Princeton and a Deluxe and a Matchless and some of those basic kind of what I, again, what I think of as like blue chip, you know, guitar tone pieces. Um, but for me, um, the more records I started playing on, and then certainly the more stuff that got released, you know, one, you're terrified of, of just copying yourself, you know, repeating yourself, you know, and, um, two, I think it does a bit of a disservice to the artist. Um, if I just kind of do the same old shit on everyone's project, you know? And so pretty early on, I kind of took this mindset of casting myself for, for projects and for artists. And so, you know, when I go and play on a, you know, a Kenny Chesney record, I was gonna not necessarily limit myself to, but start with a, you know, okay, this is going to be these couple of guitars and these couple amps, and I'm going to try to do the bulk of the lifting with these, the, this grouping, 
and make the sounds. And then, yeah, if I got to reach out every now and then for a 12 string or something like that, I'll do it. Um, but you know, it was like, well, you know, I'm going to use, you know, my Marshall and my basement and Les Pauls and SGs and stuff on Chesney. And then when I work on a Marin Morris record, I'm going to use low wattage. I'm going to use these old, I'm going to use like tweed deluxes and Supros and, you know, change it up. And I'm going to use ratty old guitars, you know, and, and, um, and try to kind of cast myself as the guitar player in the band um, for that artist as opposed to just being like, well, this is me, this is, this is what I do. And this is what you get. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, again, definitely identifying more as the chameleon than the stylist. If yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. For one to be the wrong guy in the band. Right. <laughs> kind of what it boiled down to, you know, you just, you, I kind of always wanted to be the, the period correct. You know, if you th talk about, you know, if you use like movie terms, it's like, or whatever, it's like, you period correct. Like I want to be the guy that's making the right choices for this artist and their music. Yeah. I have to think though, that that's a really difficult skill to interpret, especially when you're, when you're trying to sound, you know, in, in a, I, I, I'm trying to think of like the, the most charitable way to, to say this. The, the, the best thing I can think of is I heard Tim Pierce talk about how in the nineties that a lot of people wanted him to sound like, like a Kurt Cobain or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But presumably his skill level far exceeded Kurt Cobain, but he had to sort of reinterpret how to kind of have the sloppiness of that sort of plane in, you know, to encapsulate the grunge thing. What is, what is that, you know, what is that, what's that process like for you? I mean, are you like sitting down beforehand do you, before you go to the session being like, man, how do I, have this really sloppy right hand or is there is there like a process that you try to do to sort of prepare for a role if you're playing a part you know for the uh, uh, as a band member uh, in essence mentally how do you sort of prepare yourself for that well i think the biggest thing is having a reference point right so the the biggest thing that would stop you from sounding like kurt cobain is not knowing what kurt cobain sounds like <laughs> right so so for me, it, it, it's kind of just trying to make sure that I listen to as much music as I can. Um, and, and that swings both ways, you know, trying to stay on the tip of what would be considered modern, but also having a throwback reference point, right? A vintage point of reference too, whether that's, you know, Jimmy Page or you go all the way back to Chuck Berry or, or whatever that is, you know, early Aretha Franklin records. Like if, you know, if you, it, so for, for me, the, the answer there is, is just seriously just trying to consume as many kinds of music and being open-minded to the role guitar plays in that kind of music, because the, I think the thing probably a lot of guitarists struggle with, especially if you grew up idolizing guitar music, you know, for lack of a better word, it's, it's hard to know what to do on a song that's not a guitar song. Right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if someone set, you know, throws a ZZ top thing at your feet, you go, oh yeah, stand back. I know what to do, right? <laughs> but but when the reference is, you know, maybe Sean Colvin, right. um, uh, you know, uh, or something like that, or even, you know, to reference Tim Pierce, even something like Michael Jackson in the nineties, you know, like his part on black and white is so awesome. But yeah. the the point is, is like, you have to have a reference point. And so, yeah, the quickest way to be behind the eight ball is just to have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. When someone says, Oh, well, man, you know, like a, like a thing, like a Michael Jackson thing or like a, or this, or do you know this song or do you know this artist? And, and man, there have been times I've been like, man, I haven't heard that. Can you play that for me? Or let me step out in the hall and listen real quick and you get a frame of reference and then you can go, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then in terms of like, to your point, you know, the facilities of it all, the, the, the logistics of, 
you know, your hands or whatever. Well, that's a thing that sometimes you're just kind of learning on the fly. You know, right. if something isn't, doesn't totally come very natural to you, well, that's your exercise for the day or for the moment, right? Is it's like, okay, yeah, I got it. You know what? This doesn't feel natural to me. This isn't something I would have thought of, but they're, they're all responding positively to this. The artist seems to be excited. The, the control room says it's working. I'm trusting them. So I just need to, I need to kind of climb outside of myself and climb into this thing and, yeah. you know, try to find the magic tonally or, performance or, or or whatever that is but you you still you have to have the reference point of what they're talking about to even know where to start that's yeah. the biggest thing yeah and i like the sean colvin reference i think that uh oh man john leventhal i love that i love his guitar work on all those records. whoever played is he the one who played guitar and like sunny came home yeah he produced all that stuff and played guitar sean uh, john leventhal he unbelievable guitar player what, what do you know what he was using there to me it always sounded like a les paul and you know maybe a vox ac30 or something that he, he, he uses really i mean dare i say quirky gear but he's a telly guy he okay. he plays telecaster a lot and so i mean i wouldn't who mm -hmm. knows is the simple answer but yeah. he also played all that acoustic he's just an did he, he do the mandolin too in the intro yeah, yeah that's honey there's another record after that called these four walls yeah. it's a John colvin record that's actually got a little more electric playing but his atmospheric stuff i mean to me it, it sounds like a gretch or something but it's just his hands like he yeah. just got his touch the oh, on, on the outro of sunny came home there's like a really cool ethereal thing yeah. that, that's going on and then i also think the the really underrated thing about that album that first one is the drum mixing it has oh, some yeah. for, for 90s drum, like pop drums. Yeah. That's like it has some really nice, like just great drum mixing. That's uh that's Sean Pelton, the guy that plays drums on uh here's your useless trivia kids. If you ever watch Saturday Night Live, the guy that's playing drums in the house band there, Sean Pelton, that's the guy that played drums on that record. Did he? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um yeah, that's that's uh that's that, that's definitely uh some great tones on 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 that record. <laughs> oh, in incredible. But again, I you know, I mean, and maybe some people might argue, I don't classify that as guitar music, right? It's it's singer-songwriter music that's done really really well. And yeah. so, I think John and he produced that stuff and he's obviously just an incredible player. Um, but I think he you know talk about casting and playing a role like so perfectly like yeah. just accenting and these little tasteful bits and tonally strong and i mean it's just a master class in itself you know yeah yeah there was a another one from that sort of same generation that had really there wasn't necessarily a guitar record but had some great guitar playing was um what was her name um Gosh, she always she was always doing the the songs for all like the the pet adoption commercial Sarah McLaughlin. Oh, Sarah McLaughlin, yeah, dude, uh, yeah, it's totally, yeah. There's no, and I don't know who played guitar on a lot of that stuff. Um, I want to say those records were made in Canada. That yeah. might have been like a Vancouver thing because I know she's Canadian. Um, yeah, but there's yeah. some interesting texture stuff going on on a lot of that stuff where you know like early days of the Line Six DL4 reverse delays and stuff like that. You know, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, and that goes back to my, you know, the conversation of like the, you can tell, you know, there's period, you know, periods when you can go back and you go, particularly in country music, you can say, oh yeah, in the late seventies when everyone got a phaser pedal <laughs> on every record. And yeah. you know, Steve Lukather talk about, you know, man, if I saw one more fucked up chorus patch that was called, you know, Lukather or Toto or something, it's like, yeah, you remember when everyone got Dimension Ds or Tri Stereos or whatever? Yeah. It was just, it was a thing, and everyone got one. And then you, when you buy it, you put it on everything because you're excited about your new toy. You know? Yeah. It's, well, you, you need know, to you need to bring back the Tri Stereo chorus, Derek. Dude, I'm not gonna lie. It's I, there is one in my possession, and it's been I've, I've been putting I've been sneaking it on some stuff. So, which one do you have? A Songbird? Or do you have a Dino My Piano one? The piano one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll say it. I, I think we'll see the return of the rack before we're, before it's all said and done. I think it's yeah. kind of, I think it's going to happen. The, the key with them is though, and I think where most people get wrong is that they don't use them with 
either the X, SPX 90, which was, which was, um, which was how all of them were. They were mm-hmm. always either going into that for detune or they were going into an H 3000 to set to detune. And that, so that that's the trick. You have to be together in order for it to happen. And, and the H 3000 was usually in a, a parallel mix with the reverb. And then the delay came in the mix, the parallel mix after that. So mix one was delay and D det- or sorry, reverb and detune was mix one in parallel right, right. feeding mix right. two, which was just delay. Right. Well, the, 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 the kind of the analog workaround for that, if you will, is and like what I've been doing lately is like you, you use it to double a part that doesn't have the chorus on it. Yeah. And then you're essentially, you know, blending within the mix, you can then blend in your thing, you know? And so it's like, it becomes a part of the, the soup that is the part. Whereas, yeah, when the rack days and those guys run through the H3000, H3000 was the first piece of rack gear I ever bought. Really? Um, Cause I was just like, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, and that's again, another kind of, common thing that you you, i think you learn as a guitar player when you go through gear is it's rarely as simple as a plus b equals c it's rarely as simple as yeah this guitar through this amp with this pedal is the sound on that record it's it's there's there's a million and a half kind of variables in between of that sort of thing and it's like yeah it may have been that guitar but where the pickups the same as what you know you have and yet may have been through one of those amps but what was the signal path after that amp like what was the miking scenario what was the what kind of outboard gear were they using what were they you know you look at that um great example is like the the chris isaac the wicked game thing that you know and it's so like disputed you know because if you ask the guitar player he's like oh that was just a strap through a fin- uh, deluxe reverb that's all it was <laughs> but, but if you talk to the producers and the engineers it's this elaborate right you know, scheme of parallel compression and a plate reverb and all right. the stuff that went into it and you know who knows whose yeah. side is probably more accurate but there's 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 a lot of nuance sure. in just yeah. taking path just signal yeah. path alone, right? Yeah. You know, God. You there's know. a lot of com- there's a lot of compression on Wicked Game, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would trust the producers. I mean, the the thing that's really tricky too. For a while, I don't know if you ever saw any of these that we did, but we used to have this thing before YouTube really cracked down on on uh, the copyright stuff called Game of Tones, where we oh would, yeah totally we'd re-record these classic recordings, you know, and a lot of them, you know, you can go to Sound on Sound or some of these different magazines. And they'll talk about the signal path of a lot of this stuff. And even knowing that and using the exact same gear for the most part, you know, we'd use our pedals in a few of of the scenarios, but even with replicating that, it's still like whatever mixing is happening, you know, individually for the instrument is, is drastic, you know, because a lot of times trying to get it just from the gear alone is not enough to, to emulate the mix when you're listening to an ISO track because some of the ISO tracks sound really awful on their own. Yes. Um, it, you know, one of the best examples of it is Welcome to the Jungle. Oh. That, that it, there's, there's no frequency in there like below 2K. It's just like this, it's, yeah. just, it's just really beehive buzzy, you know, but in that track, it's, it's uh, the guitar sound is huge, you know, but individually it's like, Oh, I can't even listen to it. It's really hard to listen to. It's so bright. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, is, I mean, especially if we go down that rabbit hole, I mean, the variances that you can't recreate, I mean, just preamps, I mean, any, you know, capable engineer will tell you if you line up six Neves and run the same signal path through them, three or four of them are going to sound a little different from the rest of them mm-hmm. you know and and that's just in the preamp phase i mean you know like we're not even talking about the the voltage coming out of the wall and how that can affect the tone of an amp you know and um you know so yeah and then and then go into analog tape too which it's its own whole other you know kind of rabbit hole of of signal and you know what it does to compression and what it does tonally and yeah. you know it's like yeah you're that's a that's a moving target man it's almost impossible to but you guys always did those game of tones were always really good man yeah we just we just can't really do them anymore you know because we'd spend yeah. you know 20 30 man hours on one and then 
you know, it'd get taken down in a day. Like we put up an Eagles one, <laughs> like it did, you know, oh, it was gone in the second day. Uh, you know? Got like a hundred thousand views day one, and then gone, gone. Yeah, Don Henley doesn't mess around. <laughs> Price of fame, baby. Price of fame. Yeah, but you know that was that was that was a that was a fun experiment though because it really did teach. It, it taught me a lot about you know, when people talk about hearing the sound or like, you know, in a lot of the stuff that we do where we're recreating the sound of iconic amps and stuff like, you know, because most people are hearing those amps, you know, like Dumble amp or whatever it is, they're hearing it through a mix, through, you know, whatever signal chain there was in addition to the amplifier. And then also there's a, a technique part of that, that that is also existing in parallel. You know, I've heard Robin Ford still kind of have that same quote unquote dumble tone when he's using, you know, a fender twin reverb and a, and a, you know, and a pedal. So, completely, you know, and so there's some things I think if, it's like, if you play the lick, you're, even if it's an, a dissimilar amp, it's, it's still, there's still like a certain, uh, it's still a certain component of the way that we recognize that, that Robin Ford sound. A lot of it is, is his, his, his phrasing and, and, and his note choice as much as it is the gear completely man that's and that that part of it can't be overstated yeah um period yeah yeah so one of the things i like to do on it on every single stream is i like to ask the the session greats about their favorite picks i want to start with sleeper uh gear is there any sleeper gear that you feel like if you're willing to share your secrets here derek is there any sleeper pieces of gear that people are not recognizing that they should know about that most people don't know about. This could be pedals, this could be guitars, this could be amps, this could be studio gear. Um, man, okay. I'm, I'm looking around my room because I'm going, oh, whoa, 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 what was I using here? Let me give you, let me give a two-part answer. Let me give a two-part answer. Um, I, I don't know if this is, this is, I don't think this qualifies as a sleeper piece of gear, but I feel like I see a lot of dudes um, kind of look down their noses at uh, the, the OG, the line six M nines. Mm -hmm. I would say pound for pound. I have used that pedal. I have like five of them. Mm -hmm. I would say pound for pound. I have used that pedal on more recordings than any other pedal I own, like the verbs and the delays and the tremolo. Um, and I, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been involved in so many of the conversations of what it, the, what it does to your sound, or it's, oh, I don't like the way it does this, or I don't like the way it sounds, or it's this, or multi effects. Blah. I've used it for a decade <laughs> on, on countless number ones. Um, and that I always come back to it. Like, I think it always, it does, it does a job. It does. There's a few like kind of, um, the 63 spring sound in it particularly is like the spring reverb sound I've used for ever on a million recordings. And I've got all the real, I've got, I see a spring reverb tank yeah. I think behind you. Yeah. There's one right there. And I, you know, I've got all that stuff. So I think that pedal is awesome. And, and then, and this is maybe a little more um, to your question. Um, I'm a big tape echo guy. You and I have talked about this. Um, and I, I use the, the Rollins, the, the 501s and the 555s for forever. Love them. I've got an Echoplex that I love, an EP3. Um, but this Australian company, Echo Fix, is yeah. made. And, and I bought one. Um, I was actually on the Kickstarter, waited a while to get it. And, and I will say, I think it's, they've done it. Like they've, it's, it's all the stuff that you, you wish yeah. the old ones did. And they've got the noise floor down. And, and, and right now the Australian dollar is really beat up. So if you're in the U S <laughs> yeah. it's a great time to buy one. It might, it might be the time to jump on it. Um, but, uh, they're actually pretty reasonable for what they are. I think that they're around a, they're around a thousand Australian or so. Yeah, I think I paid less for this than the last Roland five hundred one I bought, and yeah. and I and and it and it it sounds better, and it's quiet, and it's got it's the chorus on it's awesome. It's got real spring. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say between those two, I mean, there's a there's a new thing and an old thing. Yeah. That 
that I may or may not be getting their credit, but that I use all the time. Now on your M9, is it modified or is it a completely stock one? No, it's completely stock. Nothing. I never touched anything. There was a guy doing mods for, well, I mean, he might, yeah, be, uh, there was Jack Vaughn. Yeah. And I, I remember when the, when the craze was all going and I had a bunch of guys telling me, Oh man, Hey, you got to get this guy and he'll do the, he'll do the mod. And I, I called the guy and he, he never called me back. So like I reached out to him a couple of times. I was like, Hey, I've been hearing you do these mods. I, I can send a few. And I just never heard back from him. So I was like, ah, fuck it. I, <laughs> so I, so yeah, no straight out of the box, standard, standard have, sounds. Have you found it, any of the, the criticism that people use about them to be, to be accurate as far as it affecting the tone or do you find it to be fairly neutral? Well, I, I think it, that kind of spills into this whole true bypass conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you get asked this question more than probably anybody on the earth, but it's like, what do you think about looper? Like putting everything on loops versus the, the deal. And, and, you know, here's the simple answer. If I plug my guitar straight into an amp and then I plug my guitar into the M9 and then into the amp, do I hear a difference? Absolutely. But, in the context of a pedal board that's built well, that's buffered properly, and that's isolated properly, um, is it what I would term like nominal or negligible even like maybe? I mean, like, yes, I, I don't think it's that big a deal. And you just, for me, the, the workaround is like, you know, you might just turn the amp up one notch higher than you would if you were plugged straight in yeah and and you might back down the treble right because that that's the what most people are going to comment on when they talk about the way a pedal effects sound is that they're going to lose top end and they're going to have a lower uh it's not going to hit the amp as hard right because it that's what i feel like most people and then there's noise floor problems and all that kind of stuff sure. but but for me, every pedal board I've ever had is, is wired straight through in series with a strong buffer system, you know, on the input and output. And I plug it into the amp and I turn the amp knobs till it sounds right. And I go from there. And that's kind of, that's kind of the end of it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that, that has always worked for me. So I guess the, yeah, simple answer is, do I notice the difference? Sure. Does it bother me? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there's always going to be an incremental impact anytime you're plugged into any pedals in series and, and it's, and it's fairly unavoidable. Even if you plugged into a single boss pedal. Absolutely. And plugged into your amp, you're going to notice a difference. And, and, and the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize in boss pedals is when they hear that they're buffered, it's, there actually isn't just one buffer in most boss pedals. In, in fact, most boss pedals have two or three buffers in them. Um, so, you know, in, in, in that sense, uh, you know, whether it's a line six or whether it's a boss, they're, they're all going to have some sort of impact and, you know, you can mitigate that impact more in my opinion, by going into either true bypass loopers or going into a switcher of some kind. But I, I, the thing that, that I wanted to segue in kind of from here is I've heard from a lot of session guys that use the M9 like you they they really like using it as opposed to uh you know say a midi you know programmable thing or an h9 or something like that because you have knobs that you can adjust instantaneously for the effect when needed how critical do you think it is for people that are wanting to get into sessions and they bring these elaborate midi switchers and have all the different stuff does this become a distraction on the session if a producer says, you know what, actually, I really don't like that delay tone. I need you to pivot and go to something that's more like this. Is there a certain functional standpoint that would prevent, you know, you from using something like that versus the M9? Man, I think that all boils down to like, are you going to do the homework? I mean, I, I think the simple answer is that like, yeah, if you're going to be a session player, you got to know how to use your gear and you got to be able to pivot on a dime, right? Because, you know, if someone asks you to change something, what they don't want to hear is a 60-second explanation of why they can't do that, 
You know, they don't want to go, oh, well, I got to reprogram my, um, or whatever. They, 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 like you've already lost them at that point. If yeah. they say, hey, man, can you dry it up a little bit? Or can you, you know, roll off the presence on those repeats? Or can you brighten the reverb or whatever? You, what they want to hear is, sure, yep, no problem. And so, yeah, if you're really um, a tech savvy guy, and I mean, I like to think of myself as being pretty tech savvy. Um, if you're a tech savvy guy and, you know, you're going to do the homework on an H9 when you get it and learn the ins and outs and learn all the hotkeys or have your app on your iPad or on your phone ready to go and everything, I think that's great. Um, uh, and by the same token, even if you brought in the s most dirt simple you know, whatever Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, setup you can imagine if you got a tube screamer and a spring reverb and a super reverb, it's like, you better be able to accommodate in the same way. If they say, Hey man, it's, it's, it's a little brighter. Can we back the game down or can we do all this? It's like, it, 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 it really doesn't matter how complex or simple your rig is. It just boils down to, can you make the necessary adjustments in a practical you know, time frame. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I mean, for that, and, and I promise you in the session world, we have every, every version of that on the spectrum, you know, you've got, you know, I would say on, on one, on this far end on the tech end, you got a guy like Jerry McPherson who literally can write MIDI code longhand and, you know, has, has created a robot arm at his home studio to move the mics around and stuff. And, and I mean, that guy knows, every and he, he comes from the rack days and he knows every kind of programming and midi sequencing and how to do this and he used to beta test for line six and yeah that guy's a, a genius and he's so good at his stuff and at this and then maybe on the other end of the spectrum you got a guy like jt cornfloss who i've seen come in with four pedals and use the reverb on his amp and still get world-class tones and still be able to accommodate every you know both of those guys can accommodate any request that comes their way. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it just boils down to whatever your rig looks like, just knowing it and being able to move on it, you know? Do you think there's a reason why you see so few session players now using MIDI programmable switcher, like on their pedal board where they have one that, you know, has like 15 loops and everything is MIDI programmable. Like, what is I've done a video about this, but I'm kind of curious about hearing it from the the horse's mouth, so to speak. Like, why do you not see any? Whether it's you or or Tom Bukovac or Tim Pierce, I, none of those guys have MIDI programmable switchers. What is it about doing sessions where that's not advantageous in the way that maybe most guitar players might think? Well, I think I think the word I come back to is preset. So I think, you know, what would prevent me from using it or and what has prevented me from using it is like, well, if I spend some time and I queue up a preset that involves this overdrive with this delay and this reverb, I'm going to use that preset and then, dare I say, overuse that preset, right? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of circles back to this idea of like, well, you don't want to repeat yourself very often. Right. Um, and so I think, yeah, the idea of kind of having these, this kind of batch of pre-programmed sounds and then flipping to those as your go-to, I think you're probably just asking um, for, for, you know, I don't want to say trouble, but you're, you're, you're definitely you know, dancing on falling in a rut of just yeah. kind of going to the sounds that you've built. Right. Now, now, you know, if I, in a live scenario, sure. if I was out touring with an artist mm -hmm. and had to re replicate all these sounds and all these parts and all these different things, no brainer. Yeah. Like program the chorus, program the bridge, program the, do this, switch to the next song program. Like absolutely like no brainer. That'd be the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Um, but for us, um, I think, you know, we're just kind of constantly being asked to tweak so much. Um, it's kind of like diminishing returns. Well, why would I bother making this preset when, um, 
you know, I know on this day, running it through this amp with this mic and this engineer, they're going to ask me to turn the, roll the tone back on the, the verb. Or when I go through this amp, that's, you know, 50 watts versus this amp, that's 20 watts. All the delay repeats seem so much hotter and I got to crank it down, right? So I think it's just kind of that every day is a new thing. And so it, it, it's not that it's wrong or bad. I just think you're kind of in diminishing returns to, to set up all these preset tones and, and then, you know, think that you're either a going to get away with just using all the presets for a session and, or B being okay with just using all the presets all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It certainly will put you in a position where you may be more prone to redundancy. That's for sure. By having this there. Completely, man. You know? Yeah. Com completely. So, um, and I, yeah, I just don't, I don't save, like anything <laughs> ever <laughs> it's just kind of all like always it's a just reach down yeah yeah i want this on it i want this on it okay turn it on turn the knobs that sounds cool does that sound cool is it cool in there is it working hey back this down okay cool all right is the blend can you back okay yeah okay all right cool and then you go and then and then that's it and if it's something that you really you know stumble on and love you know i might make a mental note or or even write down like man that was a magic that was a cool that worked really cool. Like my 12 string through this amp with this compressor, that was a really cool thing. And you may circle back to that, but, but not in a save to preset six. And I'll use that on the next three records I play on. You know, it's like, it doesn't, <laughs> you're just asking for trouble, man. Asking yeah, for trouble. You. I hear you. So in terms of, uh, I want to ask you now about, uh, the, 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 the Wells list of, of pedal favorites. I want to go through a couple different types of pedals and then you can tell us what some of your favorites are in those categories. Okay. All right. All cool. right. So I'm going to start with the lowest gain boost. What are, what are your favorite boost pedals? Uh, well, your boost pedal <laughs> is it. Uh, there's honestly only two, there's only two boot quote unquote it's in the mail. Yeah, there's only two boost pedals that I use, and it's your boost pedal and the RC booster, the Exotic Effects RC booster. These are the Nashville staples. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I think the the RC booster thing came along, and it's uh, particularly with that pedal, it's it's treble and bass EQs, the way that they're EQ'd on those knobs, they're just so usable. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you got something that's just a little bright, you can roll it back on the treble and it makes all the sense. And if you got something that's a little thumpy, you can roll the bass back and it just seems to work. It's just one of those pedals that kind of tried and true. It works great on every amp, you know. Um, and then the great thing about your boost pedal, uh, other than the fact that you never have to deal with a, a real volume pedal again, which is just an added bonus, yeah. um, is it just really as advertised. It's it, When you kick that thing on, it's like you just reached back and turned the amp up a little bit. And so when you're in those situations where you're either you know dropping a solo on the go down, or even if it's a thing where... I've played a part in the first two choruses, but the third chorus, it just needs a little more aggression because there's more stuff happening and we need the part to speak a little bit more or speak for a double. It's just a very useful, you know, kind of shortcut, if you will, for, yep, okay, we just need that much more. Blunk, there we go. Okay, it's, it, yep, still sounds great. Still sounds like the sound. It's just uh, amped up a little bit. It's on steroids. So yeah, those two pedals um are, are are really the only boosts i've ever used <laughs> i appreciate being in such good company the rc booster is like sort of the legacy clean boost you know yeah Never it's, it's it does a thing and it's you know and um and i i have one board that ha i have both of them on you know so i mean it's they're not redundant i yeah. would say i'd say there's they both do a slightly different thing and they're both worth you know owning yeah what about in terms of overdrive? What are some of your favorites? Uh, Ibanez Mostortion. I'll forever and always just kind of preach that one. And and I, let me be clear that um, 
so much of this stuff has to do with, like you said, the intangibles of a player and their hands and sure, the sure. way, they, the way their instruments and everything. But that pedal for me, when I got hip to that pedal and bought one, it was just like, this just works. It works. On all- told you about it. What's that? Who told you about it? Rob McNelly, another great session guitar player in Nashville. And, uh, and Rob had, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got like four of them. Um, They're expensive now. Well, yeah, but see, I was buying them when they were like 80 bucks. Yeah. So I got lucky. Um, I probably spent more to rehouse them than I when I paid for them. But um, yeah, it was just one of those pedals that y- it, it works in every amp. It sounds great through a, a Marshall or a Matchless or a Deluxe Reverb. It just kind of was one of those things that, that um, you know, is you know definitely kind of a if if there was such a thing a desert island pedal for for sure um and then um like that's the one you know because uh, let me say on a side note <laughs> on distortion pedals because this is a rabbit hole i think that um it's one of the most variable parts tonally that a guy who plays different amps and different guitars in different rooms with different cabinets can struggle with because what a, a, an overdrive pedal that sounds like the tone of God through this guitar, through this amp in this room on this day can sound like dog shit the next day in a different room yeah. or, or with someone else's hands. I mean, I, you know, I've done that too. I've, heard you know someone playing and put up put on the guitar and been like oh what happened did you change (laughs) something it sounded great when you were playing it um so for me that most distortion has always been um just a it just worked for my hands it works with all the amps that i love it worked with all my guitars um and and that's a you know that's a really really great thing and then um You know, I would say on a different note, I'm looking at my, I'm looking at a bunch of pedals over here on the ground. I mean, I would say that's hands down the, the one for me. And then there's, I would say honorable mentions are your T drive, (laughs) which, which I was actually just, I told you before we got on here, I was just using it on a thing. Um, and, um, uh, that's that's one that like when you get the magic combination when you kick that on with the right thing you're like oh holy shit that's awesome and uh um, least popular pedal by the way like we're gonna do, really yeah no people uh, have not connected with it and i think it's dude i, I use it all the time i use it all the time it's 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 well, right here in my well, well this send you a stockpile so you can just <laughs> okay yeah 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 credit yeah. production that's hilarious that's the least that's the least um <laughs> Yeah, I would say, I mean, I would honestly say that those two are the two that I use more than, more than anything, especially if I'm recording at home here with this, with my home rig. Um, Those are the, those are the two. And there's a guy that's making um, along those lines too. I'll say there's a guy that's making, it's called a Katana, not Katana. There's a guy making like a most distortion clone now. Do you know Uh about this? I knew about uh, I knew about Delana at Third Power had one. No, this is called a uh, uh, called it, the Roosevelt, I think, and it was a like Karma. Um, I have to look it up. Uh, there's a guy. I'm gonna look it up right now because it'll it'll make me crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. But that pedal is awesome. It's the closest thing to the most distortion that I've found, and um, I really, really, really enjoy it. Um, it's called the, oh, I found out. Yeah, Karma. It's called the Karma MTN 10. And it's just a, it's a most distortion clone and I love it. I have one. I bought, I bought one on Reverb and I, I absolutely love it. All right, well, let me just make sure I got the one here. I'm going to, I'm going to share the, uh, the screen here with you. All right. This is the one here. That's the one. Yeah. Like if someone came in the, if a thief in the night came and stole all my most distortions, I could survive with that car. That's a, that's a, that pedal sounds awesome. 
and it looks like they're uh, wow they're made right here in Healdsburg. So this is this is about fifty miles north of me in Sonoma County. Yeah, uh, fifteen fifteen percent off. It looks like it's a special deal right now on the Memorial Day weekend. Shout out to that dude and that overdrive pedal because that thing rocks. All right, so I'm gonna have to get one. I'm gonna oh, it's a pre order thing. I, I think I still will do it just so I can compare because uh, certainly having the uh, the switch the the true bypass switch is a big thing because. On yeah. this one, I usually I have a I have a jumper wire in it so that it always stays on because I usually just put it in my in a rack, or on a a, a, a true bypass looper. So I just have it come because the 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 foot switch it like works one out of ten times. On it. <laughs> I played it. This is a true story. I played a gig one time here in Nashville, and thank God it wasn't a long set. It was like a forty five minute little set at a club here. But the first song I stepped on that to play a solo and I never could turn it off the rest of the show. So I had to like work my volume pedal the whole rest of the gig to try to like clean up and do, I couldn't get the thing to turn off. And I think that's when I went down to someone's got to make better switches for this and started getting them all rehoused. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, they're a real pain in the butt. And, and because of the way that the circuit board is shaped, I mean, I, I've, I've not rehoused any of those, but I've done a lot of nobles uh, ones in the early days before exact tone really perfected it. I, I'd say I did the, the more primitive version of what exact tone is doing a lot of Tom Bukovac's early. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Nobles I had rehoused for him. And then, and then I think that uh, exact tone did an even better job than than i did and in, in, especially graphically uh yeah. with it. but um but in any case yeah they're they're just uh they're not easy to rehouse and you have to use a pretty high box and and uh you know but if you're if you're relying on it like you are it's certainly valuable to have a high quality foot switch and so the karma <laughs> might be a a good alternative for that yeah, I would say if you're looking for the the most distortion thing on a, on a budget, go go there because it, it, that guy's nailing it. That yeah, guy. yeah. I, I'm gonna as soon as we get off this, I'm gonna go buy one on Reverb. Pro. Yeah, do it, do it. Do it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, what about for like modulation stuff, like tremolo, chorus, uh, <laughs> M9, 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 M9 all day long. I have a. Uh, um, I do. I still think a lot of those. Um, I have a running joke with Dan Huff because I'll pull up some sort of, you know, dimension D or something like that on a session and he'll go, that's not your, that's not that M9, is it? And I go, yeah. And he go, how does it, wine doesn't sound that good. And I go, yeah, it does. You just don't, you know, you're just, a sandwich is always better when someone else makes it, you know? <laughs> um, um, but I also do love um, the um, um, Strymon. I have a, a couple Strymon Mobiuses, and I there's some really good sounds in those. I love their, uh, I like their phasers mm -hmm. in the Strymon Mobius, um, and I like their um, the tremolo setting. That's the harmonic tremolo. I think that's a really, really cool um, sound on there. Um, their Leslie sound is really good. Um, but the thing I love so much about the M9 is that like pretty much all of those modulation effects have a blend. Right. So, you know, if I want just a touch of the chorus or just a touch of the, you know, vibrato, I can blend it into taste. And that's, that's just as a studio guy, I mean, that, that's just such a big part of it is. And you can also cascade them, you know, because on the, the the difficulty with the H nine or with the the Mobius is you can only have one effect on it once. You know, exactly you can have right. multiple effects on with the M nine, which is really handy. That's exactly right. That's and that yeah, and that's a again a huge, huge part of it. And and to your actually funny enough to your your point of um of scenes and like MIDI switchers, I actually on my my main on my A studio board. I actually have my whole M9 on its own loop with one switch. So yeah. yeah, it's common that I'll have a real spacey, verby, you know, modulated sound for the verses that is maybe three different effects just on the M9. Right. Queued up. And then when I get to the chorus, I can stomp that off and it's just a big old, you know, chorus sound. Uh, like uh, not chorusing, but like a for the chorus of a song, like a just a big old rootsy guitar to amp kind of vibe and then i get back to the chorus i mean to the verse and i can hit that looper turn the whole m9 on but it's still it's a sound that i've 
built right there for the verse. I've got yeah. this delay and this thing and this thing. And then if I want to dry up for the chorus, I can do that. And then I flip it back on and do that. So that is, that's kind of, that is one trick I use for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a cool one. So I guess I don't really need to ask you about your favorite reverb and delay picks because it's M9. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we I, got the, I, the, the role or the, the clone of the, of the, 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 the space. Yeah. The echo fix. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there is period. There's no reverb pedal I've used more than that line six M nine. Now the delays I do, there's some cool ones on there, but, um, I'm still a sucker for my old memory, man. I obviously use the real tape echoes and I love the Strymon delays. I, I really like their Brigadier. Mm -hmm. uh, delay. That's one I use a bunch. Um, and again, it, it's not uncommon for me to have, you know, if I'm using the M nine and the Strymon to have a, a short delay on one and a long delay on the other and kind of go back and forth between, you know, and you can, again, cascade that on the M nine, even if you want to do some of that stuff. So, yeah. um, uh, but yeah, I, I, with the, the delay pedals, <laughs> I won't say I gave up, but there was definitely a point where I felt like for six, like six years in a row, you know, the new delay pedal would come out and everyone was like, this is the last one you'll ever buy. And there's always a fatal flaw. Every one of them, man. I mean, it, it, it just, the diamond pedals, the Empress pedals, the Strymon pedals, the, you know, I mean, any, the obviously going all the way back to the line six to the, the old green guys. It's like, uh, uh, maybe you and I should talk about this. If, if you want to make the 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 last delay pedal anybody will ever buy, talk to me because I've bought all of them, you and there's the last one every time. <laughs> and there's always one thing about it that I go, "Why did they do this? This sucks. Why did they? Why would they have it this way? Why would they?" And then I just and then you end up going back to the old thing, or you use two or three because well, this one does this. This is the best at this. This is the best at this. This yeah. pisses me off because I can't make it do this, so I use this. Yeah, and uh, a lot of it's really personal, you know. Like a lot of guys have be, have calibrated their delay ear to specific types of delay, yep. you know, whether it's a memory man or it's a tape echo or or you know whatever the whatever sort of the the the, the gold standard had become for them, you know. So it's it's yep. super dependent you know so there's like a lot of studio guys that unless it's a lexicon pcm you know type delay they don't they don't care you know they don't really you know they they can have you know any sort of emulated tape echo and it's just all tape echo to them but if you bring in a digital you know panning delay <laughs> you know and nothing else will do except the lexicon because that's kind of where they've they've made their their uh, sonic investment let's say um, as far as delays are concerned yeah, completely. And I think it also boils down to like, what do you, what do you need it to do? Like, what is, what role is the delay play for you as a, you know, as a musician? And is it's like, cause for some guys, it's just simply to give the, you know, give the sound a little space around it, you know? And then some guys are real into the, the rhythmic, the locked in, you know, using it as a percussive element or playing real parts on it. Yeah. And that stuff's all, you know, again it's like just different people you know the modulation on a delay that's guys will sit and argue about that all day long you know what's yeah. the how much do they really want and how wide do they really want it and how deep do they really want it and you know what's effective versus what's just out of tune i mean that's a big part of how guys ears can you know yeah be different on all that stuff too yeah, I, I hear you on that. Well, certainly your reference point, I think, is 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 from a very practical standpoint, and that you you know this is these are tools that you use all the time, and a lot of yeah. a lot of people that are coming to me or asking questions on you know the various online platforms, a lot of it is based around what does you know x best but they don't actually know what a real tape echo sounds like. They've never heard a real tape echo, and so there's a lot of like. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they're sort of looking to the, the the tone gatekeepers to tell them, you know, yeah. this is the best. But a lot of those guys still haven't played a real tape echo. And, and the, this is really unsexy. But I have to say the best sounding tape echo pedal. And it's not 
the coolest one out there. It, it, and I have a couple of EP3s that are my reference point. The Dunlop Echoplex pedal. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. On the no. closest to a real EP3 if you want the EP3 sound. Yep. Yep, I've 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 had uh, I have one of those laying around here somewhere because a steel player, a buddy of mine, Steve Hinson, um, who was a guitar player, started and he's now a steel player. He was like, "I've got six of those Echoplexes, and this is the pedal. This is the one. This is the one that beats it all." And I bought one, and yeah, it does sound that. But that's again, it's like kind of like even with even if we go down the rabbit hole of tape echoes, forget pedals, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got an EP3 and I've got a full tone and I've got a Roland 501 and I've got this Echo Fix. They all sound a little different. Sure. Like, there's all some things that they kind of do or is part of the preamp circuitry or whatever. I mean, just, just, just as a starting point, do you want reverb on it or not? Right. That's a part of the thing too. You know, how much control over the tone of the delays do you want i mean all that stuff is just kind of like yeah i mean what are you trying to do with it that's it you ask me what delay pedal should i buy what are you trying to do with it yeah <laughs> that's are you doing brian setzer or are you doing the edge completely <laughs> couldn't, have, couldn't have used two better references i mean that's yeah what are you trying to do with it man it, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the thing somebody in the comments is asking if you've if you've compared the volante to any of these Oh, that's uh, Michael Pope, uh, on the, another great Nashville guitar player. N no, I haven't. And here's, <laughs> it's funny. Someone was selling one of those on, I think, Craigslist the other day. I'm a, anyone that has followed my socials knows I'm a Craigslist hound. Yeah. And yeah. I almost bought one because I thought, man, I've been meaning to check that out. I've been, you know, it's like, man, a delay pedal that has that many knobs on it and that I can't set a tempo to, that I can't dial in a numbered tempo to, I'm not even gonna bother, man. It's like, to me, it boils down to kind of two, two levels of the delay pedals. It's like, can you dial in an exact tempo? Can I make it say 76.5 BPM or can I not? And if I can't dial in an exact tempo, it doesn't need more than like three knobs. Like that's the way I feel about it because it's like, well, I'm only going to use it for slap or for giving myself a little bit of room. Yeah. Right. So like MXR carbon copy is great for that. Memory man's great for that. Strymon Brigadier is great for that. But if it's going to have 10 knobs on it, I better be able to dial in 106.5 on it or whatever the tempo is, because otherwise I just don't care. It's, you know, if it's, if I'm going to go that deep on the delay sound and what it can do, I'm going to want to sync it. And so it's, it's either going to have to take MIDI, be able to be locked in or not, because if it's not, I'm just going to play my echo fix or my Roland or yeah. use the carbon copy or use the Brigadier or something like that. Yeah, or you just get the volante and just use the force, you know, and just see. Yeah, exactly. I like the, well, it's got a tap tempo. And I go, you what am I supposed to do? Tap for three and a half minutes? Like tap it in time? Like that's a whole other tap tempo. Like, oh, yeah. No, it's, it, well, it's tricky <laughs> also because all of the. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, who yeah. cares? Take it off. What about fuzzes? We didn't talk about those. Do you have any favorite fuzzes? Oh, yes. I love fuzz pedals. Um, the my guys here in town, the XTS Exact Tone, they're Imperial Fuzz. Okay, I love that pedal. What's uh, the vibe of that? That one is it like more of a fuzz face or a tone bender, or is it dissimilar to any of those? Or I would say, and I mean, God, I feel weird saying it on their behalf. I would say it's in the tone bender world. Okay. Um. Because even when it's on stun, it's not like crazy over the top. Yeah. In fact, most of the time when I use it, it's um, uh, it's an iridium fuzz, and I, most of the time when I use it, I've got the 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 fuzz, the gain pegged, and it's still just a really usable musical thing. It's not this crazy, you know, animal kind of out of control thing that you can do with fuzz faces. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, um, uh, I also love, 
um, the sub octave fuzz on the M9. I've used that on so many records. It's a joke. <laughs> and then I'll show you this. I'm going to grab it real quick. Don't this, tell Dan Huff. <laughs> yeah, seriously. This little pedal, um, it's called, it's just called Fizzy. And um, a buddy of mine, it doesn't even have a power supply. It's nine volt only. And a few years back, um, uh, a friend of mine was like, yeah, my friend's kid is making these fuzz pedals. He's just making them out of kits. And he writes, it's just like white out. He wrote fizzy on it. And it's two knobs. It's just fuzz and volume. There's not even a tone control really. And uh, you have to use a nine volt because there's literally not even a jack for a power thing. But I use this fizzy pedal all the time. Nice. So, so iridium fuzz, but I have, man, I mean, I have, I probably own more fuzz pedals than anything else. Do you have one of the old prescription electronics ones? Fuzz been, uh, I've got old fuzz faces. I don't know, prescription of electronics. I don't know about that. Maybe yeah. I need to have it. Yeah. So check this. I'll bring it up for you. So, so I've, got, I've got those. I've got the Pigtronics. The Disnortion thing is cool. Um, the new Fender Fuzz, it's called the Pelt. That thing's cool. Um, I've got, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what's on my other boards. Um, I use your, I use the dynamic distortion as a fuzz pedal all the way up. Kind of, it, it, yeah, you, you might take that as a reference, but I do use I it. No, I, I think, I think it's sort of, I think it can definitely get there. Okay. So check this out. Uh, let me, let me do this screen share again. Uh, where did I do that? All right. Here it is. All right. Check this thing out. Okay. So, so these were, I have a couple of older ones, um, but the the experience oh. pedal is way cool. They were made in Portland, you know, in the and they were sort of one of the first boutique companies, sort of in the '90s. Um, and uh, you know, they they have newer ones. I suggest getting an older one, but like Charlie Sexton used to use these, and and Doyle oh. Ball and guys like that in like the Archangel days, and cool. they sound incredible. And they have a really cool octave in them. And uh, I highly recommend these, you know, get, get one from the, get one from the nineties and, and, uh, and you'll be good. They came in swirl paint jobs and they came in um, solid color paint jobs. And at the end of the, the time that they were in production, I think ADA, I don't know if you remember that company that made like the flange yeah. ADA was manufacturing them sort of at the end there um, to make them more of an assembly line version, but uh, they're all really great. And, and that, that's a really cool fuzz. I just, I screenshotted it. Yeah. I like, uh, yeah. I mean, I have, dude, I mean, that's one I, I just, they're, they're everywhere. I've got the Zvex fuzz and the, um, this is another one I've got here. This, uh, the, um, this, uh, MXR, the La machine thing. Oh yeah. The LA machine or La machine. That's a cool one. And you can add the octave with a button. I mean, they're all, again, yeah. it's, it's kind of like, depending on the guitar, or the amp that day, you throw one on and you're like, Oh yeah, this one rocks. This is, this sounds like a fuzz pedal. What about compressors? What do you like? Man, I rarely use, this might be a hot button topic. I rarely use pedal compression. Um, uh, for years, I swore by the Barber Tone Press. Oh, yeah. Um, and I liked it because of the blend yeah, the thing. control. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I, I and I, I swore by that for a lot of years. Um, because when I was playing, when I was first touring, I was playing for this guy, Josh Turner, and I was playing a lot of traditional Telecaster guitar. I hated the way the Dynacops took all my top end and stuff. Yeah. And, um, I loved, I responded to that compressor pedal first because I just thought it was like, oh, this is cool. I keep on my top end, but I hear what it's doing. And it was a cool thing. Um, but now I kind of just use, if I'm using a compressor pedal, it's a very specific, like I'm going for something. Like it's a sound. So like I'll, I'll grab a Dynacomp and put it in the chain and plug in because I'm going for that thing. Right. Or um, the other one I love is the, the Dunlop, uh the base it's called a base comp it's the yeah. white compressor yeah. pedal yeah that has the led readout yeah yeah because it's kind of like an 1176 yeah in a, in a pedal is like what they meant you know or they're trying to do at least yeah. 
Um, uh, but yeah, I don't keep um, exactly zero of my pedal boards have a compressor on it. I should I, send you one of the Nile ones that we did because it's got like the oh yeah, that's right, yeah, and, and you the style mic pre on one side, and then it's kind of a hybrid. It's not quite an eleven seventy six. Like if somebody looked at it and was compared to eleven seventy six, it'd be like. Yeah, it's not really that that close, but it's sort of optimized for guitar, you know, because obviously 1176 can be used on a lot of different instruments, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not, not just guitar. And so I've sort of optimized it, but it's really cool not just to doing the compression thing. It also is really cool if you want to do sort of like the Stonesy Beatles or like the Lindsey Buckingham thing where, where a lot of that was just compression that was overdriving a mic pre. Yep. It, a lot of that distortion was 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 done that way and so it's pretty cool like i really like using it typically i don't like uh compression on humbuckers but if i want to do that fleetwood mac thing it's really cool to kind of get uh some of those like uh you know rumors era you yeah, know like rian and tones and all that stuff yeah yeah, yeah. people don't realize he was playing a les paul for so much of that that's just yeah the les paul custom man the white one fuck yeah Come yeah on. That hand, he just he 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 could swing so hard and was just doing all the finger style thing, you know. Yeah, man. Yeah, crazy and great at acoustic, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, totally, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's that's really cool. I'm glad that we kind of went down the 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 gear rabbit hole to a degree, and and I think the 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 single takeaway is, as you said, M nine, M nine, M nine. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, dude, if you pound for pound. I've probably used it more than any pedal ever. I mean, I'll just say that. Has Line 6 tried to enroll you in the uh, HX Effects, kind of their newer equivalent of it? I have one. And there are some things that I like about it. Um, but I don't like the user interface as much as I – I mean, the, the M9 is just like idiot simple. And again, I'm a techie, geeky guy. Like yeah. I do deep – I'm the guy that gets something and reads the whole manual. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, I got the HX effects to do everything that I want it to do, but I, I think the M9's cool. I, just, I don't know. I just prefer yeah. it. I, I, I'm, I mean, I think it's a great, it's a great device, and, and uh, you know, I still really love the DL4. In fact, I love the green DL4. I have one that I modified probably ten years ago with the switches, and I, and I fixed the, uh, the output problem that it has. That, that was the biggest thing. The green and the blue pedals, that was the big thing everyone always complained yeah, about. Yeah, but once that's resolved, I, I prefer it, you know, not that I'm saying the timeline is a bad sounding unit, but I actually think that the the idiosyncrasies of the DL4, to me, make it actually a more authentic analog yeah. or tape echo. Um, but uh, yeah, so I want to finish up, uh, Derek. I want to be re respectful of your time. There's a couple of folks that asked some questions. So I just want to get to a few, a few of those before uh, we complete, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah. So uh, one person asks, uh, what's been your favorite project uh, to, to be on at, at this point so far? Or do you have a favorite? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's admittedly a hard, a hard question to answer because it sometimes, if I'm being really honest, sometimes what makes certain projects more or less special to me it doesn't even have to do as much with the music as like the memory or the, the time spent and what the process was like and did I enjoy it and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then there's also some moments where I think I can say that um, the stars kind of aligned where I, I kind of felt like even as a quote unquote chameleon, they really teed this up for what I do, you know, yeah. kind of, kind of in parentheses. And I would say that, um, you know, um, maybe, uh, the, both of the last two Marin Morris records, well, her only two records, the, yeah. the first one, a hero oh, yeah. and, and then, and then girl, um, you know, Marin and I, or, or, or just pals. And we, you know, I met Marin, you know, she'd only lived in town a week and, and it was just kind of happenstance that we ended up kind of working together. And, and we've just always had a good thing, man. I just am such a fan of hers. And, and she uh, seems to kind of, um, uh, you know, a lot of my instincts, my first instincts on her music seem to be what she also gravitates to. Yeah. So 
I would say, you know, I'll, I've always kind of said, you know, someday when my daughter is like, Daddy, what did you sound like playing guitar? Those those Marin records will definitely be a couple like, of records that I put on and go, this is what I did. This is what. Oh, yeah. Those are the, the I was going to one of the questions that I had was kind of about that. We ended up kind of talking a little bit about about some of that stuff and using sort of crappy guitars and small amps and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's some of my favorite, uh, you know, for your tones, they're they're I, they're some of my favorite Derek Wells tones are on those, and and you know I'm I'm pretty good friends uh, with some of the guitar players that have you know had to then reinterpret those yeah. those yeah. parts. Bennett, uh, Lewis, yeah. you know, I love, I love Ben, man. Love yeah. that. So you know, and and uh, and I had another friend that was also in that band who kind of did a few guitar things and then some keyboard things named Josh Murdy. Yeah, Murdy, Murdy's a good pal. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so it was cool to to kind of uh, you know not only know you and kind of the source, but then kind of see how it translated to the live thing. And, you know, I, I know that they appreciate having some good guitar parts to, to, to go <laughs> to uh, once they get out there on the road. So God, uh, that's always the thing too. You just, you just hope that the guys in the band like playing the stuff, you know, that'd be the ultimate is, you know, you have your, have an artist come back and say, my, my band guys hate the stuff you play on my records. <laughs> you know, that would be the worst. Yeah. Uh, another question is, is, is how did you get uh, connected with the uh, Sen guitars or how did you come across those? Oh man, Jeff. Um, well, you know, I mean, he lives here in Nashville and he, man, Jeff is just a guy that he's kind of a, just like guitar sensei to a bunch of us. I mean, one, if anyone doesn't know, Jeff is an amazing guitar player himself. I mean, if you follow him on Instagram, you, you have to know, cause he, he plays so great. He um, he, just kind of before he was really building guitars, he was just kind of this dude that a few of us had connected with in town, and he was doing some luthier work. And he just kind of has like pixie dust. It's like you'd bring him a guitar that you know you weren't loving, and he'd kind of take it and he'd play it. And he'd kind of pull on the neck and and mess with a couple things and hand it back to him and go, man, it feels pretty good to me. And all of a sudden it was better. Like it, it's <laughs> kind of one of those dudes. Yeah. And, um, and again, like definitely, uh, I think the most distortion thing, if you follow that all the way back, I think Jeff sin star, I think Jeff sin is the one that started kind of showing it to Rob and a couple other guys. I could be wrong, but I think that all kind of goes back to Jeff and, and he's just the nicest guy, just the best guy. And so um, it was just through that friendship that kind of one day um, I was like, man, I really want you to build me guitar, but I've got a great old telly and I've got a great old Strat. So I'm not really in the market, but here's, and the first guitar he built me was one of his, what I think he now calls jazz bastards, but it's a, it's a jazz master style guitar. And I had him put two gold foil. I didn't, I put Tysco gold foil pickups in it. So that was the first guitar he ever built for me. And, um, I just, I still use it. I actually was playing it today. I use, I mean, that was probably eight years ago. Yeah. And, um, and then over the years, it was just kind of like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm kind of, I think I do want another telly. Could you, and just, <laughs> Hey man, I think I could use a cool strat. Would you, you know? And, and so, yeah, now I think I have four Jeff Sin guitars and, uh, uh, even as someone who has old ones, um, I've never played a guitar of Jeff Sins that is less than stellar. Yeah. Everyone, he just doesn't let it leave the shop if it's yeah. not great. Yeah. And I have bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold so many vintage Telecasters and Strats trying to find magic ones. And then I eventually just break down and have him build me one. And that's what I was looking for. It's just right you know so and i'm super fortunate that he's a friend he's right down the road yeah. you know he probably lives eight miles from me and you know if i need something tweaked or whatever that's you know i'm super fortunate that i can kind of lean on him for that so but can't say enough good things about jeff sin yeah they are great instruments i can attest yeah. somebody was asking in the studio who who do you play for do you play for the producer for the artist or the end listener or the audience oh, What's, man, what do you have to play? dude that is a great question whoever asked that question that's a great question man that was uh, matt Plummer. okay maddie Plummer. great question dude 
If you find out, let me know. Uh, <laughs> you definitely can be um, a slave of of multiple masters, and I I think um, uh, that some of it just boils down to reading the room, right? Like who is making the requests, who seems to be the point of quality control, and the reality is with artists and producers there are some that are more or less involved in every little process. Some artists are really hands-off. They just kind of want to set the, they set a vibe or they're good at kind of setting a general direction. And then the producer gets in on the nuts and bolts. And then there's some producers that are like that. Some producers are more hands-off and, you know, they're really involved in certain things like the key of the song or the tempo of the song, but then they kind of lean on the artist to, you know, be real hands-on and, and there's times when they're all hands on and you kind of are going, are you two listening to, you know, each other? Cause it's, you know, <laughs> I've had, I, you know, I can't, I mean, just on the talk back, you know, there's times when someone goes, man, it just needs to be just really like chill and like laid back and ethereal. And you're going, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then, you know, right at the last minute, someone else puts on the talk back goes totally what he said, just like hotel California. And you go, <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Are you guys listening to each other? And, and I mean, that can, I mean, that, and then, you know, they're going two, three, four, you know, so it's, you know. <laughs> I that, want Ethereal like Hotel California. Oh, dude. I mean, dude, it's, I've, it's, if you can dream it, I've heard it. Um, and, um, you should come to one of our local blues jams. Some guys, uh, look, okay, this one's in the sea of G. Oh God, at least I'll be playing blues. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean that you do. I mean, yeah, you you definitely get caught in those crosshairs sometimes, or I should say the crossfire sometimes, uh of what someone's saying and another person's maybe saying. And and I mean, I just think it, it really all boils down to reading the room. You kind of have to gauge each person's level of investment in, you know, how many notes is this person giving? How much do they seem to care about, you know, for lack of a better term? You know, how much are they are they going, hey, 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 about this, hey, 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 about this. And you end up kind of gravitating to who more or less is asking the most of you. And then also just always being willing to shift your focus if that person that has been quiet all day finally steps up and goes, Hey, Derek, I think um I, I think it should be this. And it's like, well, if they haven't said something all day and they're saying something now, it's probably pretty important. Yeah. Or at the very least. Maybe they felt uncomfortable, but finally they feel comfortable enough now to make a request. And if that's the case, I really want to make sure that they feel heard. Yeah. Because they're kind of stepping out on a limb, right? You know, and yeah. a lot of this recording, if, you, if you've never done it before and all of a sudden you're the only person in the room with a bunch of guys that hasn't played on 20 number ones, yeah. it can be intimidating and hard to speak up. And so I, I'm always just trying to make sure above all else that people feel comfortable asking me something yeah. even if that means two or three people are asking me of different things i'll cross that bridge when i get there but i want them to know that they can ask and that it's you know it's important that they feel safe asking yeah well it's it's a it's good that you understand those distinctions because i think so often especially in in settings like that we you know the it, it's usually the the more extroverted or outspoken person that tends to absorb the most attention and certainly in in social situations the hair is favored over the tortoise <laughs> i know and, and sometimes you know i'd be lying if i didn't say you know sometimes you know you have to make it a point to go check in with somebody you know i never want someone to feel like the train is running away without them and their music is on it yeah you know um so yeah i mean occasionally if 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 there has been someone that's obviously involved in the process but have hasn't been very vocal throughout the day. I'll make it a point to try to go and check in with them. Hey, is this is this are you like is this cool? Are you liking this? Are we doing a good job for you? And and make sure that they at least have the opportunity to to you know even if it's just oh yeah I, I love it. I'm just I'm just sitting here taking it in. It's like well okay great. At least I knew I checked in. You know. Yeah, and here's the last question for you. And I think perhaps maybe the the most uh, the most poignant uh for somebody that that's in your your position or at least at least in my view it, it's it's from uh 
Samuel, and he asks about how do you balance uh, work and life, we having a family, you're, you're a father now, um, how do you negotiate sort of all the, the session work that you're doing, and in, in, in certainly you're in demand with all the hit records that you've played on, and now you're a dad and, and a husband and all these things, how do you, how do you negotiate that uh, work-life balance? Man, I think, um, I think it's one of those things that, uh, you know, if you talk to guys, you, you know, that have been doing it longer than me and are even more successful than me, um, they will tell you that you never really figure it out. I would say that the quote unquote balance is, uh, or I should say perfect balance is unattainable. Mm -hmm. I think the goal is to make sure that you're always aware that you need to try to keep the balance. Mm. And there will be times that you shift one way or the other. You know, if you're standing, if you're the, if you're one man standing on a teeter totter, Mm -hmm. and you're trying to kind of float there in the middle, it's almost impossible to just keep that thing perfectly level, right? It's, it's going to inevitably tip to one side or the other. And I think for me, it's always just boiled down to being aware so that when I feel it tipping one way, I can at least try to counter it before it all comes off the rails, yeah. And, and there's times when the lack of balance is calculated. I certainly have conversations in my house with my wife of, Hey, just heads up. The next two weeks are going to be a little, they're a little wild. It's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm backed up against, you know, whatever it is, deadlines, or these three people are all cutting at once. And I'm going to have some long days the next couple weeks, but there's a clearing here. And, you know, after that, I'm going to, I'm going to shut down for three days or I'm going to do this or, or I'm at least not gonna, you know, I'm gonna make it home for dinner a couple nights a week or, or or whatever. And and I think it's just being cognizant that you need to keep a balance. Yeah. Is the best that anybody can hope for because our business is full of a, you know, what have you done for me lately? And <laughs> And musical emergencies, you know, which uh, that's another quote, you know, there's, there really is no such thing as a musical emergency, but a lot of people will, will, will convince you that it's an emergency or that they need it yesterday or that, you know, this is, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've done it, you know, I've stayed up till three in the morning to do an emergency overdub for someone and then they didn't download the transfer for four days, you know, right. stuff like that, you know, um, so you know, I think it, it, it's so easy to, to get caught up in the, you know, saying yes to everything. And hey, sometimes financially, you have to say yes to everything, you know. Um, so I think if anything, you give yourself a little grace um, when the, the scales get shifted out of balance a little bit and you just do your best to correct. Yeah. Um, you know, no one's going to get it right all the time. And I've never talked to any of my peers or mentors or heroes that have ever once said, oh yeah, man. Well, yeah. When I was about 53, I, I just, I figured it out. Actually, I do this and I work and I just figured out that if I eat breakfast with my wife every morning and I leave the house at nine 45 and I come back at 7 PM then everything's balanced. It's, that doesn't happen, man. It's, yeah, sure. Well, I think it's like you said, it's like the balance is, is almost in the tension. You know, and, and the tension and negotiation of, of 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 this kind of ebb and flow. That's exactly right, man. I think that's the that's the thing. And like I said, just the awareness, just to, you know, just being able to check yourself. And and maybe if maybe that's your partner, you know, or your spouse or a friend being able to kind of help you check the, you know, I, I, you know, I always say like, you know, there's definitely been times I've you know scraped a lot of guardrail, but I've never gone off the cliff. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think that's the, sometimes it's calculated, 
and and sometimes it's not, but you know, whether it's yourself checking yourself or, or some, you know, a partner that you can trust and listen to checking yourself, I think it's just important to, to be aware that, you know, the balance needs to be maintained. And that's all, man, that's all you can do is be aware of the problem. Yeah. Be aware that this can go really bad if you let everything get out of control. And as long as you're, you know, focused on trying to keep a balance, that's all you can do, man. It's all you yeah. Well, I think that that's a, that's a great place for us to, to complete for today. Derek, I sincerely appreciate you being very candid, giving us sort of the, the behind the curtain look, talking to us about the gear, about your start. Um, I, I thought it was really cool to, to hear about some of the Marin Morris stuff as well. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the big gear takeaway to reiterate is M9. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm gonna uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll post that all over Dan Huff's uh, Facebook page. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Let him let him know, and um, yeah, just thank you for for being such an open book. I I, I you know I hope it it has value for those that that are watching, and and uh, certainly it is invaluable to me. I, this, there's a lot of gems I think in this, and and uh, I I certainly look forward to. Uh, I appreciate your your liking the T drive. It, it seems like you're the only one. <laughs> um, I but, got this gold one right here, man. It's awesome. Yeah, but we'll have to we'll have to stockpile you before it goes out. So you know, maybe we need maybe that will become you know. I, I think in when it was out, the Mostortion was not popular. Yeah, that's what that'll be. That'll be me in like another ten years. I'll be going. Yeah, I bought like four of these T drives when they weren't that expensive <laughs> enough, so I've just got them everywhere. It's yeah, like, yeah. So you need to be the Jeffson, uh, you know, to the Mostortion. Yeah, okay. You are to the T drive. You're gonna. It's gonna become this this Nashville sleeper. Um, so I appreciate that, and and I'll, I'll be tell everybody sure. the gold ones sound better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for for that and for the the the, the honorable mentions with some of that other great stuff and, and I look forward to uh, following back up with you in person one of these days once uh, once yeah. once the, these travel restrictions are, are lifted and we can in, engage in person. Yeah, man, absolutely, Mason. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks again and have a wonderful evening. Okay, buddy, have a good one, man. Good night.